their heart and guard their lives from sin. Thy word, the choicest rules impart to keep the conscience clean, to keep the conscience clean. Tis like the sun, a heavenly light that guides us all the day. And through the dangers of the night, a lamp to lead our way. A lamp to lead our way. Thy word is everlasting truth. How pure is every page that holy book shall guide our youth and well support our age and well support our age. Please be seated. <clears throat> Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. What a fantastic evening we had last night. We had, uh, I think, the best participation and the most uh, visitors that we've ever had. It was very well done. We want to thank Stephanie and Mike, and I know that they had a lot of helpers as well. But we had 22 trunks and, and uh, several other people involved. Uh, we had about 70 of our people involved in some way in this thing, and, and I think that's wonderful. And we must have had over 300 people come through here. Served, uh, Stefano can tell you, we served a lot of hot dogs. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, the highlight of my, it was all great, but the highlight of my night was when little Caleb came by, and I said, now, this is twice you've come by here. He said, I've just been here two times. <laughs> so that's great. I loved it. <laughs> well, tonight is the fourth Sunday, our family time together, and so we hope that you'll come. We're going to be uh, doing some congregational singing. And we got anything special going uh, tonight? Okay, going to learn some new songs, have some prayers, and have good fellowship together. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We have been studying from 1 Peter, God's message of hope. Now, we live pretty close to the coast, so we're always aware of when those hurricanes are coming our way. Fortunately, we've not been hit directly. Uh, the only time we've been affected since I've lived in Jacksonville is when we had to get out of town, get out of Dodge, if you were. Uh, back in the 90s, we had to, to pack up everything and leave, and then it bypassed us. But it, go, it went north, but we have a lot south and over in the Gulf, and, and we're aware uh, of what happens and how it affects countless thousands of lives. The, from the hurricane, the relentless waves just rip the beachfront property. They tear houses down like they were matchsticks. The piers, the boats, the roads, they wash away as wave after wave is hurled against the beach. We're also familiar with flooding. Uh, we, we know that there's flooding, always flooding around the Mississippi River. We had some up in South Georgia and, and actually several years ago here in North Florida and out in the Midwest, a lot of flooding. And, and people are trying to hold back the torrent and, and they'll put out these sandbags. And, but then they just stand by and they wait and they watch for everything that, 
that they've worked for, that they've schemed for, maybe even they've lost their souls for, just wash away. Life is like that. These are tough times we live in. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Because we can face those times. And just in our Christian life, we face all kinds of waves. We fight, we fight waves of humanism, waves of legalism, waves of worldliness, waves of, of indifference, and waves of apathy. All of these are battles that we fight. And, and in these troubled times, what, what kind of hope can we have? Well, that's what Peter is writing to us about. Uh, in a time when good people are, are losing things that they hold dear, like their values, they're being overrun by a flood of evil. And, and so there seems to be nothing solid for us to stand on, nothing underneath our lives, nowhere to stand. Well, it's crucial that we do have a place to stand. And Peter is saying, look, the place to stand for hope for the future, the place to stand is on the Word of God, Amen. on the Bible. The Word of God is the very Gibraltar of hope. And when you stand on it, you may tremble, but that rock is not going to tremble. It is going to be firm. We live in perilous times, but we have God's Word to see us through. What does Peter say about the Word of God? Well, first of all, turn, uh, I've already told you to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter says the Word of God brings us hope because it is the infallible Word of God. Look at verse 10 of chapter 1. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. You see, the prophets prophesied about the crucifixion and the coronation and the suffering and the glory of God. And then after they wrote it down, they had to look at it and say, what is this all this, what is all this about? They didn't know. How did they know to write it? How did they know to speak it? The Spirit of God told them to either speak it or write it. And so the Bible is not the word of man. It is the Word of God. In 2 Peter 1 and 20 and 21, uh, Peter said that the Scriptures are not of private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And, and so it wasn't the men. That's the reason they had to look at intently at it, is because it didn't come from them. It came from the Spirit of God, from the Spirit of Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said, All Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect and thoroughly furnished. And so think about our children. We just sang the song, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts? What did the song say? Looking at the Word of God. Well, and so we want our children to have an education. And so we, we make sure that they're in school, either public school or private school or home school or whatever way, but we want them to get an education. And we want to make sure they're studying. Did you do your homework? What about that paper you've got to write? We want to know about that. We want to know, are you prepared for that test that you're going to be having? What about the Bible, friends? Are we worried about how much education our children are getting in Scripture? We need to be. Are they studying? Are they preparing for that class? Are they preparing to go live in the world armed with the Word of God? I tell you, friends, the Bible is the greatest manual for success in the world. We want our children to be a success. We, they need to know 
the Bible. It is a handbook for marriage. It's a handbook for child rearing. It's a handbook for business. It's a handbook for relationships. It is a book for living. The Bible. It's the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world, but the Bible came through him, right? He's the word. And so here is our hope. And so since God is infallible, then that means that his, since he cannot err, that the scriptures cannot err. Christians believe in the verbal, the plenary inspiration of scripture. So what do those words mean? Well, verbal is taken from a Latin word that means verbose, speaking, talking. Uh, and it's talking about being word for word inspiration. Jesus said in Matthew 4 and 4 when he was answering the devil, when he was being tempted, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's a word for word. Yes, God uses human personality to communicate with other people, but it's his word. That's the reason the prophets had to search intently once they spoke it or once they wrote it. Then they had to search it intently to see what it was all about. And then there's the word plenary. What does plenary mean? Well, it's from a Latin word that means full. That means that we believe that the whole Bible is the inspired of God. Not one part is not more inspired than the other part. We can't say, well, this, this was just written by man and this part was written by God. No, it was fully inspired by God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then what about the word inspiration? It's from a Greek word that means God breathed. God breathed. All scripture is inspired of God. All scripture is God breathed. Another recognition of the word for word. Uh, God has given us the scriptures word for word. And there are no contradictions. Because, again, because it's in the, it is the infallible Word of God. But number two, Peter said we can rest our hope on the Bible because it is the inexhaustible Word of God. After the prophets wrote it, they themselves then had to study it. They had to search it. They had to scrutinize what they had, what they had written. The Bible is deep. It's inexhaustible. You can search it, you can pray over it, you can memorize it, but you will always find more and more every time you read it. Somebody says, Don, have you ever read the Bible all the way through? Yeah, I have. Two or three times. Well, then why, do you, why are you reading it again? Because I always can learn more every time I read it. When, when I first started preaching, for the Logan, when I got into ministry, I never thought about being a pulpit preacher. I was going to be uh, a personal evangelist, someone who was out talking to people and converting them, and that's what I did for the first few years, and then I had this opportunity to preach. And I preached for several Sundays, and then I went into a panic. I thought, I don't know, I've already preached it all. <laughs> I was just preaching the first principles. But now, you know what my panic is? I will never live long enough to preach everything that's in this book. I know it's not there. Every now and then somebody will say, Don, I, I really appreciate the way you know the Word of God. And you know what that does? It makes me want to crawl under a rock because I know so little about this Word. I've drawn a few buckets, but there's an ocean of knowledge and wisdom in this Word. Dr. R.A. Torrey, a gospel preacher, had this to say. Many men of strongest intellect, of marvelous power of penetration, of broadest culture, have given a lifetime to a study of the Bible, and no, mo no man who has really studied it has ever dreamed of saying he has gotten to the bottom of the book. New light is constantly breaking forth from the Word of God. The fact that it has proved itself unfathomable for these centuries is a positive proof that in it are hidden the infinite treasures of the wisdom of God, and no scholar who is worth his salt would say that he's mastered 
the Bible. It's inexhaustible. The truths are inexhaustible. I've been studying the Bible seriously now for 40 years since I first started preaching. And I'm constantly discovering new beauty. And as the scriptures say, the mercies of God are new every morning. Paul said in Romans 11 and 33, quoting from the Old Testament, he said, Oh, the depth and the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of God. That's the way we need to look at scripture. Oh, the depth and the riches. The prophets search the scriptures, and show, so should we. In John chapter 5 and verse 29, pardon me, I think it's verse 39, uh, Jesus was talking to the scribes, the Pharisees, the, the elders, and he said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you can find salvation. Those same scriptures tell you about me. They were searching the scriptures, but they didn't look deep enough. They didn't really understand who the Messiah was. Friends, are you searching the scriptures? Do you really know who the Messiah is and what he does for you and what hope he gives you? Search the scriptures daily. But Peter says also we can rest our hope of the Bible because it is the imperishable word of God. The imperishable word of God. Look at verse 23 of 1 Peter 1. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of, God, of the Lord stands forever. Do you buy bananas? They don't last very long. You buy them, they're green, you can't eat them. Uh, but before you know it, they're too soft to eat. Perishable. Flowers are perishable. You, you buy flowers for somebody, especially if they're cut flowers and they're gone. You know, my, my wife loves hibiscus, and so uh, we didn't have any. So for Mother's Day this year, I went out and bought two hibiscus plants, and I planted them in the front yard. And all oh, they were blooming, and they were so beautiful. And, and she liked them so much, she went and bought two more. And I planted them in the backyard. So every day she sat there taking a picture of her new blooms on this hibiscus plant. You know why? Because they're going to fall off. They last about a day and a half, and then they're gone. They're, they're perishable, and, and we understand that. But this Word of God, and Jesus said in Luke chapter 8 that the seed is the Word of God. In the parable of the sower, talking about sowing the seed, he says the seed is the Word of God. And so this seed, this Word, does not die. There are seeds that could rot or decompose if they're not stored properly, and, and so they're not worth anything. You could sow them all you want to, but you're not going to reap anything from it. But here you have the Word of God. The last book was written 2,000 years ago, and the whole book was written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, and you take that seed, and you can plant it, and it will grow in any age, at any time, with any people. Amen? It is imperishable. But number four, he says we can rest our hope on the Word of God because it is the indestructible Word of God. Look at verse 25 again. But the Word of the Lord stands forever. The Word of the Lord has no seeds of decay in it. Man cannot destroy it from without. This book has been fought against, it's been scorned, it's been ridiculed, it's been burned, it's been laughed at, and it's even had laws passed against it. Did you know in Scottish history there was, was a time when ownership of a Bible was a crime worthy of death? Diocletian, a Roman emperor, demanded that all copies of the Bible be destroyed because he wanted to get rid of Christianity. And so people have fought it they have burned it, they have twisted it, they have ridiculed it, they have ignored it, they have never studied it, but it still stands. It's there. And it will always be there. 
A man was told to build a wall four feet high that could not be moved. So he built it four feet high and five feet wide. He said if it is knocked over, it'll be higher than it was before it was knocked over. That's the way it is with the Bible. You know, you can, you can ram your head against it all you want to, but it's going to be higher than it was when you started. That's the way it is with the Word of God. Enemies come and they do their thing, and the so-called corpse is outliving the one who supposedly killed it. And so the Word of God is timeless. It's ultimate. It's eternal. It's endless. In Matthew 24 and 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word will never pass away. And then we have here in 1 Peter 1, 25, the Word of the Lord stands forever. But number five, Peter says we can rest our hope on the Word of God because it is the indispensable Word of God. The Bible is what we preach. It's our tool. You take away the Bible and we have no message, right? You take away the Bible and there's no reason for us to, to gather here this morning and, and open up some book. The Word of God is indispensable. It's indispensable, first of all, for salvation. Look at verse 23 again. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living, enduring Word of God. We are conceived by the Word of God. We are conceived in our mother's womb, but that's perishable seed. But the Word of God is imperishable. My father got old and he died. His father before him, my grandfather, got old and died. I'm getting old. I am perishing. But you see, the beauty is there is a part of me that will never die because the divine seed has been received within me. The Word of God is absolutely indispensable for salvation. People can be won to Christ with nothing other than the Word. The power to salvation is in the Word. But the Word of God is also indispensable for sanctification. We are cleansed by the Word of God. In John 17 and 17, when Jesus was praying, He, he prayed, talking about His disciples, sanctify them by Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. We're sanctified by the Word. We're set apart by the Word. The psalmist said in 119 and verse 9, How shall the young remain pure? By living by the Word of God. Living by the Word of God. That's how we remain pure. In John 15 and 3, Jesus told His disciples, You are clean because of the Word I have given you. The Word is indispensable for our sanctification. It's a powerful detergent for cleansing your life, and it will help you to stay pure. John, in writing uh, 1 John chapter 2, he said, These things have I written to you that you will not sin. So it keeps us clean. It keeps us pure. It keeps us sanctified. But number three, the Word of God is indispensable for our sustenance. Look at chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that it may grow up, so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That you may grow up in your salvation. To be complete, to be mature, you must feed on the Word of God. You, you know, you come to me and you say, Don, I'm just not feeling well. I feel so weak. I feel queasy. I, I'm, I'm, I can't think right. I can hardly get up and walk around. I, I'm, I, I'm really sick. I said, well, are, are you eating regularly? And you say, yeah, I eat every Sunday. 
Matter of fact, I, I have a big meal on Sunday. I, I eat for about two hours. That ought to be good enough, right? I eat regularly. Every Sunday I eat. And I say, man, that's the reason you're sick. You've got to eat every day. Let me ask you today, how are you feeling spiritually? Do you feel spiritually anemic? How often are you feeding yourself spiritually? You can't just do it on Sunday for two hours. Some of you just for one, right? I didn't see you here for Bible class. <laughs> so anyway, you can't, you can't do it on one hour or two hours or even three if you go to small group. You can't do it in those three hours. You've got to eat regularly. If you don't feed on the Word of God regularly, then you're not going to grow. Babies crave milk and adults crave meat. Uh, the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 5 that when some of you ought to be teachers, you're still drinking milk. In other words, they were just doing the, the things I began to preach on, the first principles, and that's it. They don't get in deep into the Scriptures. They're not really students of the Word. But he said, Mature people crave meat. They want the strong stuff. And so if we're going to grow, we're going to have, it's in this, the Word of God is indispensable for our sustenance, for our growth, for our maturity. We, we must have it. And so the Bible, the Bible is infallible. The Bible is inexhaustible. The Bible is imperishable. The Bible is indestructible, and the Bible is indispensable, and it's necessary for salvation because by it we are conceived. It's necessary for sanctification, for by it we are cleansed. It's necessary for sustenance because by it we are made complete. The only way to grow is to feed on the Word of God. By the power of the Word of God, I urge you today to come to and follow and love Jesus. If it means you need to come forward while we sing, please do so. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.